the work, Justin. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Reverse the Verse. This is Wednesday, uh, February 24th, 2016. Uh, I'm your host, Community Manager Jared Huckabee, and this is our special February subscriber edition of Reverse the Verse. Uh, basically, we're taking questions specifically from our subscribers for members from the CIG writing team. Uh, Laura team, whatever you guys call yourself, you guys can talk, tell them what you guys call yourself. Do you have a name yet? Do you have like a team name? Lore. Lore team? Yeah. Lore team? All right, the Lore team. Uh, immediately to my right is uh, senior writer, Mr. Will Weisbaum. Hi, how's it going? Uh, head of linear content, Mr. Uh, Mr. John Schimmel. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, after that is associate writer, Mr. Adam Weiser. Hello. And our archivist, Ms. Sherry Heiberg. Hi. And joining us from his exile in the United Kingdom, <laughs> head writer, lead writer, Mr. Dave Haddock. Hello. Hello. How you doing, Dave? Good. Good. <laughs> Cold. All right. Uh, before we get uh, started, why don't we give everybody a little intro about what you do for Star Citizen so that we they can tailor their questions for you guys. Uh, Will, why don't you start us off? What do you do for Star Citizen? Uh, a little bit of everything. I, I work to support Dave in writing all the... Uh, scripts and story for Squadron 42, creating all the content that's really excitingly going into the uh, PU Alpha currently, all of uh, the news updates uh, that you see on the site every week, we, we develop as a team and uh, just uh, as well as helping with some of the marketing lore as well for when we sell products and ships and stuff. Mm -hmm. That's one of the best things about working here is that there's so much variety in what we do and so much of it. <laughs> right. <laughs> what about you, John Schimmel? What do you do for Star Citizen? Uh, my job here has sort of morphed over the time I'm here. I started as a story consultant, and I worked with Dave before Will started on the, the develop the story for Squadron Forty Two, and then I spent some time producing video content for the site. Um, most of my time now is spent producing uh, the performance capture shoots. Uh, that we do in Ealing, at the Imaginarium Studios. A massive undertaking. <laughs> <laughs> I had brown hair a month ago. <laughs> <laughs> and Adam, what do you do for Star Citizen? Yes, as, a, as an associate writer, I support uh, Dave and Will um, in basically everything Will described, you know, writing uh, jump point articles, news dispatches, uh, lore for marketing, ship components, um, Galactic Guides, uh, a lot of the star map stuff. So yeah, there's just so much, as Will said, there's so much work to be done. I'm just part of the team to help kind of like uh, lay a base foundation for some of it for them to then go on and uh, uh, tailor to the exact needs. Gotcha. And Sherry, what do you do? I uh, manage the game design document, Confluence. I basically make sure that all the information is findable. And if it's not findable, I find it and put it in its place. Uh, <laughs> she does that for it. us, too. I do. Or banish I, it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I make sure the data is in place for the star map. And I validate the astronomical data that we're working on to make sure that all our systems are scientifically accurate. And match <laughs> with the lore. Mm -hmm, and that match with the lore, of course. Yes, uh, when, when you guys work down in the community hall with us, the, often were the times this planet isn't doesn't have the orbit it should, mm -hmm. and, and this mm -hmm. star is not the right color for its size and stuff. Oh stuff. yes, the great star color change yep. yes. of 2015. <laughs> <laughs> Very serious good. about our work. Good times, good times. And Dave Haddock from the UK, what what do you do? Uh, uh, I have a little bit of everything. Uh, uh, Will already said that. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Squadron 42 uh, PU. Um, um, Marketing, marketing stuff, stuff. I mean, sort of whatever they need me to do, uh, but basically just all Star Citizen all the time. Yeah, Dave's in the UK right now doing deep dives with uh, the design team at Foundry 42, shoring up uh, Squadron 42 stuff, which is coming along nicely. Okay. Yes, but I have a delay, so if I speak weird, that, that, that's not because of the delay. <laughs> All right, so yes, these, this is the CIG writing team, the lore team, the story team, for lack of a better term. So your questions, uh, 
would be best uh, suited for that kind that realm. Uh, we are taking questions exclusively from the subscriber chat on the RSI website. So if you do have a question you want to ask the story team here, uh, log into the RSI chat, hit the subscriber tab. If for any reason you are your subscriber and the subscriber tab is not appearing for you, in the lower right hand corner under more channels, you should see your subscriber tab. Again, assuming that you are a subscriber. If you're not a subscriber, you're welcome to watch and enjoy. And become a subscriber. Yeah, well, I was, I was getting <laughs> I try not to do the hard sell. And, and, but yes, you, 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 into well. yes, you also can become a subscriber. That process is automated, so it's right away and you can ask us questions. Right, do you subscribe? It's the hard so. thing about hanging out with writers. They rewrite you as you go. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Uh, don't, don't even get me started. <laughs> so, so while we're waiting for the subscriber chat to pick up, we did uh, collect some questions over the weekend in the subscriber's den, which is a forum dedicated to subscribers. Uh, so we'll start off with one of those questions. Uh, from Longcut, he asks, how is progress on the Galactopedia coming? Who wants to take that one? Um. Well, uh, we have some plan. We've made some plans with Turbulent to get the Galactopedia launched. Uh, we've been working on deciding what content we want to uh, debut first. Yeah, uh, and and as one of the long term things, I, I've been going through and uh, helping compile a lore canon that that collects lots of people, places, events, uh, and starts to break that down. So when it does come time to put it into the Galactopedia format, we already have a base of uh, a lot of that information ready to go. Um, yeah, Adam's been great about calling through kind of all the old news updates and stories that we've released so far and making sure that all the kind of stuff that we threw out when we were writing at the time has been logged and tracked so that we can make it as an easy reference guide. Yeah, I think uh, through like May of 2014, there are already 300 plus characters that were mentioned in official lore um, so far. So, uh, and that that's only May of uh, 2014. So there's there's still more to, to, to kind of slog through and, and find the right place for. Uh, we, we haven't talked about the Galactopedia in a while. We've, we've, got, we've added several, uh, several hundred thousand star citizens since we have. Uh, can you, why don't you tell us what the Galactopedia is, for those who may not be familiar with it. It's the in-game encyclopedia of everything Star Citizen. Uh, think Wikipedia, but better maintained. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Shots fired. No, not shots fired. I love Wikipedia. <laughs> and more honestly fictional. Yes, more honestly fictional. There you go. <laughs> Now, you, you, you said in-game. Will it also be available outside the game? Like on the website, maybe? Uh, from what we've been talking about with Turbulent, that the first place it'll go live is most likely the website. And then it'll also hopefully be easily available from your Moby Glass is one thing we've been talking about. So we'll have to see how it shakes out. But that would be really great to have it as an in-game and out-of-game reference. Gotcha. All right. Uh, one of the questions from the... Chat to follow up to, to the Galactopedia one. In the description for the Galactopedia, there was a backstory stating that they originally attempted to contact the Vanduul for participation. I, I want to know if they will send people over and how well that went. I assume, I it, assume went it went very poorly. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> um, uh, Shrike asks, Will future updates to the star map trickle in as they become available, or will they be added in batches? Oh, I can answer that one for sure. I've been trickling in updates as I get them, as we confirm what we want on the star map. I've been adding them. I've been keeping a change log, and we've been talking with Turbulent about making that change log public. All right. Cool. Uh, yes, again, for those asking questions about weapon sizes and such, that was, that's not a question for the, uh, for the lower team so much. So keep the questions coming. We'll stick to the list for now. Uh, good job, Krom. Krom asks, will there be an option to run around naked in your own ship? Or at least your underwear? <laughs> and this question was picked by, Will, by Adam Weezer, so we're going to make him answer, answer that. <laughs> well, I picked that one specifically. While, while we don't quite know exactly how the, the clothing system is going to work, I know one thing Dave uh, had mentioned a while back is that he would love if players might have the option to be wearing like flip-flops and shorts while flying their ship. 
That said, if you get in a firefight and you're, you know, you get vented out into space, you're, you're toast. But uh, there, there's, we haven't confirmed whether that's going to be allowable, but I know that uh, that was a dream Dave once had. So hopefully we can make it in game. Um, I guess, I guess we'll have to see. <laughs> Mostly because it would just be funny. <laughs> the dream of flying around in flip flops. Yeah, oh, how sad would that be? You come upon a wreck and there's just two flip flops floating. <laughs> Dave had it that year. <laughs> Last one sad Birkenstock and a hacky sack. <laughs> <laughs> made one last trip to Margaritaville. Gotcha. Uh, a follow-up question about the star map from Goku. Is the fact that there is no threat information on the star map intentional? Uh, we, we kind of have the high-level rating systems going on um, right on the, on the high level where we kind of track the economy and the, the security mm -hmm. level and the population, but we're still kind of working with the PU design team on figuring out more the specifics of what a, a threat level would be, how is that going to be spread across the system. Um, it's not like a, an entire system will be as dangerous throughout. It's going to have pockets of more dangerous hotspots and not. So we're still talking through how that's going to work specifically with the gameplay before we build in too much of that information on the lore side of things. All right. Uh, Ferret asks, the current environment for Star Citizen holds quite a few parallels to the golden age of piracy back in the 1600s. There are unexplored areas, territorial governors, a powerful empire, pirates, ships, etc. How cognizant are individuals or groups of this fact? I guess he means you guys. Are there any lessons that can be learned from history for either the UEE or some dissenting factions? It would also seem to be that there would be at least a few social or economical lessons to be had. Does this knowledge shape how you approach certain factions in Star Citizen? Yes. Um. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, the, I think the... The piracy, the era of piracy, was definitely was part of conversation early on in the, in the development. Um, like Ben and Chris you know, would talk about that, that type of stuff. So it was definitely influencing it. Um, I mean, again, for a lot of this stuff, we use it as sort of a launching place, and then we, we to, to create sort of the broad shapes of the universe, and then you make it, you make it, make it our own. So I think there's there's elements that you could look at that would be directly influencing the game, but mostly we wanted to once it starts to take a life of its own, we wanted to develop how it would be narratively exciting and fun. Gotcha. All right, uh, let's see, what, do we have any new questions? Are there, uh, Bobsled624 in the chat asks, are there plans to update the lore and or history of a system based on the actions of the persistent universe's populace? That mean In real time? Uh, he doesn't say in real time, just, hmm. uh, w I, I guess, will, will players be able to affect the, the history and lore of a system? After the fact, the history or the were they? Well, will they be able to create new history Correction. for the for the system? Oh yeah. Yes. I mean that's the idea. Listen, uh, that's the hope. Yeah, it really like once it gets to the newsworthy level mm -hmm. of actions or something big enough happens, uh, hopefully we'll be watching that on a game level and being able to track it and incorporate that into the lore mm -hmm. is is really our hope. But also. But also the, uh, the, uh, the economy, too, like, like if the economy of existing tanks because resources, resources are, down are down or prime is up, then, then you know, that, 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 that ideally would affect the look of the area, of the area or, you know, or whenever the, the, the direction, direction that the system takes because there's now, it's now a prime-ridden prime system rather than a, you know, a, neutral a neutral one. Yeah, we were talking to the environment artists about the potential of maybe being able to have the economy affect how much litter you find on the ground or how much graffiti is on the wall. So the worse a place is off economically, the more dirty and grungy it's going to look and vice versa. So if you help an area out, if you start chipping more and more stuff to it, maybe it starts cleaning up its act a little bit. Yeah. So, But, the, but a player's ability to impact the way the, future, the history is written depends on the 
extent of, of the impact of what they're doing. Yeah. But it right, we probably won't memorialize you're having a beer. <laughs> Most likely not. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, on the Galactopedia side, as, as it updates, as the game unfolds, as the game is fully released, we would very much like to be able to record impactful player events, like taking down a well-known pirate, for example. That's what we really want to do. Yeah, yeah. it's just the, the challenge yeah, of finding the right threshold mm -hmm. on, on which that you go from, like, like John said, just being another person out there, like being a part of the solution or part of the problem, to actually kind of like mm -hmm. doing enough of something to, to become well known for it. Mm -hmm. Sort of like life. Yes, yeah. yeah, sort of like life. <laughs> Hopefully. Gotcha. I guess a follow up question to that from uh, a name I can't pronounce. Sorry, I'm not even going to try. Ethne? Eth Ethne? 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 Well, will our characters in the. P nope, that wasn't the right one. This is from Piet, sorry. <laughs> I'm messing that up. Messed that whole we're thing live. up. We're live. Yep, we're live. <laughs> <laughs> if the player names are going to be made a part of official history, what will happen when they have crazy, inappropriate names? Hmm. Or, or if they have names with seven do, digits after them. Do people do that? Yeah. We had a, que we had a question from. Yeah, yeah we, have, we, have a, we have a question from Corrupt You for Fun One. So what, ha what happens if Corrupt You for Fun One does something amazing in the universe and gets written into the lore? Well, it's not so inappropriate. No, but I mean, is, is the lore going to say it was Corrupt You for Fun One? Uh, we've talked. I mean, I, they, they yeah, with some of them, we've, we've sort of created our own fail face for it, like. You know, the early discussions were that you could name the system, but it would have to be vetted through the UEE before they would accept it as the actual name, which would give us a buffer. But I mean, you know, if corrupt you for fun, one kills the Dread Pirate Roberts, you know, you know. That's kind of okay. Uh, and also, I, I mean, we might have it so that your RSI website account name is not. We, we might allow it to have your fictional display name as well, so that that's your account name is Corrupt You for Fun One. We're saying that a lot. Um, <laughs> but your character's name is George. 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 <laughs> for Fun One. Uh, now, what, what I'd like to do is have your character's name and then in parentheses your account name. And a link to your account. Yeah. So, yeah, we'll have to figure out how all that information is displayed and the, and the diegetic versus non diegetic nature of that info. Luckily, we have some time. Okay. Uh, Timothy Muster asks, at some point in the PU, will there be NPCs based off of the CIG team? One can only hope. Uh, there were a fair amount of team members who had their heads scanned when we were filming yeah. up in the, the UK. I've seen mm -hmm. Will's head scan. Mm -hmm. I got my head scanned. It was great. That's <laughs> impressive. Um, Keep talking. <laughs> so, yeah, we so, yeah. actually spent uh, uh, part of yesterday assigning team members to NPC characters. So. Oh, really? That's great. Oh my gosh! Are you are you letting the team members have a vote in who they play, or you're just kind no, of? This is not a democracy. <laughs> <laughs> are you in the game? No. Oh. I would have to shave. Yeah, oh, that's true, huh? We scanned a few people with beards. We did, and, and, no, and no, we, it's, apparently it's, it's we just it's got like, busted like, for it yesterday. <laughs> yeah, but you have to. Yeah, you would have to do a facial thing. You have to, you have, to have a beard if you have a beard. Basically. Yeah, you would always you have scan to. with a beard. You have to have a beard. Gotcha. Huh. Mm. <laughs> uh, Bobsled six two four asks how involved in the writing. How involved in the writing. Okay, okay, there's some typos here. How involved is the writing team in the design of systems and alien species? Or are you consulted and, and contribute after the species has already been created? Uh, Dave? We have a car alarm going off, if that's what you hear in the is background. That, is that me? No, it's us. Oh, it's, it's, us. it's us. Yeah. Um, um, it's, usually it's usually kind of an open, open conversation. I mean, very early, very early on, Chris. You know, we had talked about this with alien species in very broad strokes, but as the team grew, like, and people started kind of sipping stuff, like, more people get into the conversation, and their art needs and animation needs and stuff like that. So, I mean, we, we still stay, contribute to the conversation, but there's just, you know, there are more, more people involved in it. Uh, logical Chimp 
asks, what type of techniques, tricks, tools do you use to come up with characters, names, backgrounds, etc., in order to avoid having everyone in the verse being a middle-aged white male? <laughs> to put it another way, how do you get diversity without inducing the feeling artificially in the distribution? Well, we, I mean, it's, it's part, of our ca part of casting, for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's mm -hmm. part of when we talk to the casting director, we very specifically ask, you know, for diversity. It's definitely a case when we're naming characters, because one of the ideas that uh, international boundaries have kind of dissolved uh, in the empire, now it's more about planets. So before, where you would have these names that were kind of segregated by what country you were from, that those boundaries have definitely kind of eroded away. So as we develop names, it's kind of fun sometimes. A good method is to take a first name from one country and a surname from another country and combine them in interesting ways. So that can kind of give it uh, a more kind of different vibe than what we're not used to. So. Yeah, I, I personally keep a stack of magazines at my desk and sometimes I'll just open it up to one page and choose a first name, open it up to another and choose a second name <laughs> and just try to try to put something together that way because it, it, making every name a reference or, or named after someone, it, it, it takes too much thought. Sometimes when you're writing you just, you just need a name and you just, you know, sometimes it's best just to, to make it slightly more random um, so you don't fall into syndrome. magazine is highlights. <laughs> <laughs> so they're all named Goofus or Gallant. <laughs> <laughs> highlights was a good publication and I was a loyal subscriber for several years. Don't be offended. <laughs> uh, are, do you guys work with the alien languages at all? Yes. Yep. Uh, somebody's asking how the Banu alien language is coming along. Any chance we can get a sample soon? <laughs> uh, they are, they are um, not Lex. Banu was first. We have another, we have one, another on one on tap, tap and, and, and then Banu, I believe, was the plan. So, yeah. so it'll, be it'll be a little while. Okay. They're linking name generators in chat now. <laughs> but it's help. really Thanks. fun to watch them develop the languages. Yeah? Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, speaking of names destined to, uh, to join Star Citizen's storied history, Space Herbie asks, <laughs> does game development drive the story or does the story drive the game development? It's really kind of both, and, and it's great that way, is that we'll come up with a fun idea and go pitch it to design, and vice versa, design will come up with a really fun scenario and come to us to help spice it up or, or smooth out the, the corners of it to make it make sense in the universe. So it's, it's a lot of conversation back and forth, and I kind of think that's the way game development should be. So, I mean, it's, it's worth noting that you know Chris is very intent on the game feeling cinematic mm -hmm. and, and hanging on to a really cinematic sense of story and character. So it, 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 it sort of, the two things dovetail a, a lot, you know, the, I think st the writing team drives the story and the dramatic parts of, of, the, of the game and then it, when it turns into gameplay, a design has some ascendancy in, in that. But it's, it's definitely an ongoing collaboration. Sure. Uh, Farewell Red asks, do we see families in the game, either in capital ships or starliners? Families? Um, so far, I, I mean, having children included in video games is always a bit of a, a risky proposition because, uh, to be frank, violence against children falls into a different category. Uh, and so by including them, you suddenly open up all these possibilities of kind of situations that you may not want players getting into. Um, so whether we're going to have them in like lockdown areas or not, they're also a whole different set of animations and models and stuff. So right now I think they're pretty low down the list. Um, be a question more for Chris, I guess. Uh, I think we'll, we'll definitely have couples that you'll see around 
We'll have to talk to Bender about getting an animation where two people are walking with their hands in each other's back pockets. (laughs) (laughs) That'll be important. (laughs) That's oddly specific. (laughs) That's how you tell when people are dating. Oh, all right. Uh, Sherry, would you mind changing seats with Will, please? (laughs) (laughs) I no longer feel comfortable here. I'm staying right here. (laughs) Um, When uh, Mask writes... When does information become lore? Can you guys rewrite anything you have written up until now, or is it all considered official and unchangeable? Uh, I mean, we can. We, I, I try not to retcon. Personally, don't like retconning unless absolutely necessary. Um, but... Um, uh, technically, it's all malleable. It's just it's we're developing it in public face, so it's a little weird. We have to, um, you know, kind of choose what we can to to wreck on. Usually, if it's if it's something really firmly established, I think we try to do whatever we can to not wreck on it. But if it's little details, it's okay to, um, it's okay to kind of amend it to 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 save us some trouble down the line or make something else work. Yeah, I would say in a, if, in, under normal circumstances, you'd be free to wreck on whatever up until release, right? But because we're so public facing, it does give you an, an additional challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you have to be really careful that you're not, you, you don't retcon yourself into a story that's gibberish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of ripples from when you change one small detail, and we see it all the time of, we'll, we'll try to adjust something and then. It really spider webs quickly into a whole bunch of smaller other changes. So, yeah, because the game is so story driven, there's a kind of, there's a like a film there's a film version of an ecology to it, and it it it's shocking how much impact one small change can make. So it, it requires a lot of care. Okay. Um, do you guys ever write Easter eggs into the story for Squadron Forty Two or Star Citizen? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> is is there an Easter is there an Easter egg that you wanted to put in but weren't able to? So that's not a spoiler because it's not in the game. <laughs> hmm. I don't think. I don't so. think so. I can't think of anything. Like, I can do whatever I want. So <laughs> nobody tells me what not to put in the game. Not not yet. I mean, we <laughs> try to be- make them more on the subtle mm-hmm. sides, so we haven't. Yeah. yeah. Kind of. I mean, part of it. I don't know. Part of it's also the idea that. Um, it has to exist in its own right within the, the 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 reality of the game, so it can't stand out too much. But if you dig just under the surface, you can catch the reference. But um, yeah, I mean, there's nothing like you know, you're not going to find you know the big Lebowski as you know Jeff Lebowski in the game, you know, because that wouldn't make sense. But like you know, there's a guy who's known as a dude. Who wears sunglasses? Maybe that you know. Then it becomes a little bit more palatable because they, you know, they can exist within that reality and make sense. So. Oh, rugs for spaceships. <laughs> and you do always complain about great. no carpets in spaceships. We need more carpets in our spaceship. He's a firm carpet and spaceship <laughs> guy. Is let that know. It ties the room together. Yeah. It really ties the room together. Uh, Space Cowboy asks, "What is the Star Citizen novella?" I, it was an old, it was one of the, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a book. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dave. <laughs> Can you tell us anything more about the Star Citizen novella? I'm trying, Space Cowboy. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I'm working on it, actually. I, I've been developing it over, actually over the holiday, the Christmas break. That was a, about two weeks of actually working intensely on the, the novella. Um, uh, yeah, no, I think it'll be cool. I'm not going to spoil anything yet but it should be really it's going to be really fun I mean, you're going to spoil something later <laughs> <laughs> it's the story of the dude oh, in his flip flops <laughs> exactly. about a rug, rug. <laughs> <laughs> toupee uh, let's see okay um, Grey Dog asks do you have a storyline in mind when the procedural generation team creates a planet or do they come up with a planet and then hand it off the concept team and then you guys write for it? Um, all, uh, all planets I'll go, I'll go started kind of the, the star map was very lore based and 
and talk about stuff with design, but a lot of that of what would make this system interesting and unique, what were these planets kind of like. Um, procedural generation, we haven't worked too closely yet, but they will be hopefully building the planets off kind of the specs that we've outlined, especially now that we're starting to pull in real scientific data from our consultants to uh, help the procedural generation team set parameters for the planets they're building. Yeah, at this point, they're, they're working on the tech. You know, once, once they get the tech into a, pl into a place where, where it's ready to actually start building planets, then... Yeah, I know all the planets in uh, Crusader, or around Crusader, have drastically changed size in 2.2, .2, so <laughs> <laughs> it's been fun to look at that. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, Crusader in 2.0 and 2.1 was the size of Jupiter, just to see how big they could make a planet. It wasn't the intended size. Really? Was, yeah. Uh... <laughs> we we need to measure it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that, that was their goal anyway. The, the, the goal was they wanted to see how big they could make a planet, and now they're attempting to size the planet to what yeah, it's supposed to everything's scale. Everything's been spread out a lot more. It's it's really exciting stuff. Yeah. 2.2 .2 is pretty fun. Yeah. It's one of the reasons we call it the baby PU or the PU light instead of the PU. It's a test bed. They're, they're experimenting. All right. Uh, Lamac. Lamac. La Big Mac has a question specifically for Sherry. So nobody else answer this. It's just for Sherry. <laughs> have you gotten all the backlog archived, or is there a substantial amount to do yet, and how does that affect the other things you want to do to work for the game? I'll take this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, what does he mean by the backlog? I That's... don't know. What do you mean by the backlog, Lamac? He's not saying. Maybe all the stuff that you had to organize when you first came on board, did oh, you talk no, about that? Oh, no, I'm still organizing that. <laughs> the thing is that there's always new content being produced, and so there's it's like fighting a mountain, basically. You, you just fight a little bit of it every day and make sure that you, you, you keep the pile of the mountain that you fought in one corner, and eventually you'll have a mountain of your own, and then the mountain will be a hill. But it'll always be producing pieces of content, well, and it'll always also, be managed. But it's not affecting... Will we'll like to make new pages. Hmm? So what? Will, likes Will likes to make new pages too. Just to know. I've been slowly copying That's Wikipedia good. over into our confluence. <laughs> and, uh. Yeah, no, it is. It is what I do about sixty percent of the time, and I spend about forty percent of the time on the star map. Gotcha. Cool. Uh, Zeros asks, "How is it trying to write the political intricacies between all the races and planets in Star Citizen in comparison to other games you may have worked on?" fun uh it's i haven't worked on another game <laughs> I, I i mean something we've been fleshing out as we keep talking about in, in these interviews we do about how we're fleshing out more of the lore and backstory for the alien species and and it's really getting that balance of what is each species unique perspective on these different topics and trying to balance them out and make them have their own unique flair so kind of going through of how they treat crime and how do the view slavery and juxtaposing that with how the UEE feels about stuff. So that's that's been pretty great and we're starting at, very recently we've been putting out a little bit more content uh, on the more recent news updates and in the uh, this month's subscriber supported Jump Point magazine. Become a subscriber. Um, Become a subscriber. So it, we, we've been releasing more kind of alien based content as we firm up kind of our background work so that's been a lot of fun yeah it's uh, uh, uh so it, it, it's, a, it's a fun thing to do just because by knowing some of those very basic concepts of the different species it uh, not only informs the species but it can also greatly inform like the systems or the planets uh on the border or in the region or kind of their development history so that's that is one of the fun things is to think about how life in a cer certain system or how a culture developed in a certain area based on its mixture of xian influences or banu influences on top of um whatever kind of like astronomical features made that system special too so it, it's fun how small things like that strands can infect the the game in different areas uh, and the um, you know we spent so much time with the UEE like trying to make them feel like a really textured and morally gray you know political system and 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 society that you know we want to make sure that all the other ones have that same type of complexity and richness to them and and feel compelling and interesting and you know have lots of opportunities for really cool stories basically. Hmm. 
Uh, Merv DeGriff asks, is anyone writing things like the UE Navy or UE Advocacy Field Manuals? Uh, not, <laughs> not directly. Okay. It's, tough to, it's tough to. It's really hard to write that stuff just as a straight up like I'm gonna I'm gonna write this book. We 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 tend to kind of seed it into other documents that we write, like news updates and you know portfolios and stuff like that, um, just to try and figure out like you know how spe specific aspects of it work. And then, but maybe you know it might be fun to put together uh, you know a straight up field manual for advocacy. I don't know why the, the advocacy has snagged my imagination. Of, of I, I, I go into Confluence and I try to read as much about the advocacy as I could as I can. I don't know why. Because they're awesome. Because they're awesome. <laughs> uh, question from Doc. He wants to talk generally about Xi'an. Okay. Uh, so, there we go. That should be actually. We should just ask that. How do you pronounce Xi'an? <laughs> Uh, there's multiple pronunciations. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I just want to ask any tidbits or any crumbs about Xi'an life, social structure, kinship structure, rites of passage, taboos, power structure, and the makeup of the elites, etc. It seems like the Xi'an are coming into focus now in your minds. Okay, and so I just and so just hearing you talk about how the Xi'an might or might not behave and operate would help share that vision with the majority of us in the community who really do care and appreciate the imagineering effort and value and value it as much as the engineering effort. Sorry, that was a lot to read there. Nice so sentiment. basically, he basically just wants to know, give give him a tidbit about the Xi'an that he doesn't know. Give him a crumb, a morsel, something to defeat his Xi'an imagination. Uh. Can I can I give it can I give a tidbit, Dave? Go for it. Go for it. Uh, so something really fun that will probably not have much game impact, which is why I'm choosing this as my tidbit, uh, is that uh, we've kind of been talking about the possibility that they evolved as carrion eaters, that they eat kind of rotting plants and animals as the preferred food choice, and part of that is that their spicing is very heavy to make up for the fact that their taste buds are less sensitive than ours and as well as that their spicing tends more to be textured based. So a lot of like prickling or numbing sensations in their spices. Spices. So uh, if you go eat at a, a Xi'an restaurant, you might get a, like a well-fermented kind of wilted plant seasoned with kind of a, a prickly numbing heat. So there you go, Xi'an tidbit. That's bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> They're yeah. aliens. You oh, know, yeah. <laughs> this, this last jump point with the focus on Aopa and, uh, um, and Kaifa was, was a lot of fun to kind of like dip into the, the, the Xi'an and, and start to talk about them internally. And there are a few kind of like unapproved docs that, that we have floating around that have kind of like started to sketch out ideas and visions for, for, their, for their culture and, uh, and so forth. And it was a lot of fun to, to, to spend some time talking about that and starting to develop that. So it's, they're definitely coming into focus and it'll be, it'll be fun to, to, to reveal more of those uh, attributes um, as we go along. They're pretty into flowers. <laughs> Aopa, is that how we're pronouncing that? Aopa? Apoa. 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 See? Mm -hmm. yep. as, as in flower arrangements? Yeah. They just like flowers. <laughs> I, think they're, I think they're awesome. Yeah. I, 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 Centennial I think, bloom. I think letting everybody pronounce these things in their own way is, is actually kind of cool. It's more diegetic. It's more like the real world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Just how everybody's, mm -hmm. you know, depending on what region you're from, everybody pronounces certain words differently. So I, I like that we don't go out of our way to correct people too much, although it is Xi'an. Okay, another question from Bobsled624. With Chris and Star Citizen being committed to a fully fleshed universe, how do you imagine the lore of companies, i.e. ship manufacturers, featuring into our daily lives in the PU? For example, an energy, an energy efficiency scandal from RSI faking the efficiency rating of their power plant. Somebody owns a Volkswagen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so how do you expect the lore of the companies to, to affect their daily lives in the PU? Um, Sorry? Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, I mean, the other week I was talking with... Uh, one of the designers about how fun it's going to be when we have uh, the possibility of a, a first ship coming out once the PU's live. So kind of like 
uh, a company actually launching a new ship in the verse and experiencing that fiction through your character would be kind of an exciting way to use the lore of a company that way. Uh, scandals would be really interesting. We had the kind of uh, Goldfinch scandal with the origin, which was, which was fun. Um, so stuff like that popping up in game. Um, maybe recalls. Recalls would be really interesting too. And, and we've done that before in the back end of lore, but as a way to, you know, when we're doing a bug fix or something, we can skin it as that. <laughs> um, so yeah, so hopefully a lot of different ways. And a lot of advertising everywhere for the companies, mm -hmm. you know, when you visit Cryastro Filling Station or, or showrooms and stuff, having mm -hmm. those companies advertise as yeah. well. Or steal a Big Benny's machine. <laughs> <laughs> Which we do not recommend. <laughs> steal Big Benny's. All right. Uh, da, 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 da. I skipped around, so now i got to remember which ones I've already read and which ones I have. Okay. Ask them again. We'll just answer yeah. differently. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's in flux. We're in development. Yes. Pre -alpha. Pre -alpha. <laughs> well, some of these questions are, 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 are the same, too. So, and, so, and sometimes the answer to one question answered this question. So, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. right. A question from Chris. Chris, Shris, X, Riss, what? Sorry, you guys spell your things weird. I don't know what to do. <laughs> I have enjoyed the lore regarding the war on Vanduul. Some dates are now set in lore, I guess, to support the upcoming Squadron 42. This being a development project where roadmaps are constantly changing, how do you con do you constantly adjust the dates in the lore, or do you manage them by other means? I guess mm. that falls into the previous question about retcons. Um. um. I mean, we've been pretty good about them so far. Uh, I mean, I think with a lot of the stuff, I mean, at least with the, the current developments of Vega 2 and, and, and Bishop's campaign, like these things don't happen on a dime. So we have a little bit of latitude. We try to, you know, try to build that in, I guess, to make it a, a, a bit easier. But, you know, the, at least particularly with the Vanduul War, I think we have a little, we have some latitude as to, you know, uh, when events happen around uh, the ones that we've established, so we can we have room to play and we don't paint ourselves too badly in a corner. Yeah, I do. Uh, yeah, in 900 years of history is a lot of time. So Dave did a really good job with the start laying these foundations of through the this day in history and kind of a really broad time. Sorry, being on the table, broad timeline. Um, and so there's these big gaps though, and it, with that much time, it's pretty easy just to toss somewhere something in between two different dates and kind of have it work out for the most part. Dates, I think, has been so far one of the least things we've had a retcon. They've been pretty sticky, so. There's a lot of wrestling with them early exactly. on, right? Yeah, because yeah, it was the systems, actually. Once we started building the system maps, we started, because originally at the, the initial phase, the PU was only, I think, supposed to be 20 or 30 star systems, and then it expanded, uh, so the the ones that we had already created kind of expanded out and suddenly there was now you know 100 or 110 or, or whatever the number is uh so not the time capsule had established dates that now had to be uh transposed to this new arrangement of systems so some of them got a little funky because you had to like the the system the, specifically the system where first contact with the banu was was much closer to Earth, but when the, system, the map expanded, suddenly they were far away from the banner, so it didn't really make sense. So we had to kind of figure out how to how to place it so it made sense in the narrative again without retconning too badly. Yeah, I forgot about that. The, the, all the hard work you did on kind of that discovery timeline of making sure when the star map was final that we were discovering things in the right order. Because I think there was a couple instances where a system that was really far away had originally been discovered much sooner than was humanly possible so yeah, yeah. cool uh Brebase asks regarding language how updated will the human language be will there be slang that we'll have to get to grips with to follow a conversation with npcs human language has changed quite a bit in the last 40 minutes 40 minutes <laughs> uh, i mean even old english here on earth is much different a thousand years ago than it is now so yeah. 900 years in the future 
does human language change much? I mean, we have, I mean, we have the Cathcart flying, uh, the sort of pirate cant uh, type thing. I mean, I, you know, I mean, I've sort of kept it somewhat similar just for me just because it's easier to write and it's you know it, it can get a little obtuse if you need a dictionary to understand what a person's saying to you uh and also i mean it just it gets trickier once i mean I, once localization comes into the picture i don't even know how we kind of handle that type of stuff yeah it, it's the same way like how movies will often have characters that should be speaking a foreign language just speak with an accent instead just because of having to deal with an audience understanding the material. So, I mean, I think a recent example is The Witch, which was trying to be historically accurate as much as possible, but even their Old English mm -hmm. isn't really Old English because no one would be able to understand it. Um, so, for that sake, we've kind of been going lighter on it and just sprinkling in new terms when needed. Um, booty call has probably <laughs> been one of the, like, the heaviest slang. Between that and Star Watch, which is using all the pop culture slang. We've kind of been introducing new words. You know, everyone loves blading. So. <laughs> Cargo Olympics. <laughs> Cargo Olympics, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, here's, here's a question for Sherry. Hello. Does the star map at present represent the physical locations of everything? Uh, is it an accurate representation of everything's physical location in uh, the verse? No, it's not an accurate like, representation of the physical locations. Uh, we, we are still working with the designers uh, to make sure that the stuff on the star map will eventually be in the place that they want the planets in the PU. Um, and so the star map is a continuously evolving thing. Um, but uh, the jump points that we have in place are accurate as far as our work with the designers. Gotcha. All right, let's go back to our question list here. Uh, Aragorn, BHS, will there be any underground cities or bases designed to protect people from an uninhabited planet environment? Perhaps this might be a planet that has not yet been terraformed yet, but might be in the future. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's all we're going to say about it. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the upcoming Nix uh, landing zone is an example of that. Levski mm -hmm. is underground. It's an old mining facility that's been taken over. So that's completely sealed up. I think there's one in Banshee. Yeah, Banshee, Lorna, and Banshee okay. too. Um, a Banshee has a has a pulse. Uh, I think a pulse star. Um, a pulsar. Yeah. So uh, I think that uh, would make that that planet uninhabitable. But um, there's lots of mining there, so the um, everyone lives underground there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They have their probably be hard to live on the surface of Hades. Yeah, they have like yeah. their power plants on the surface that get energy from the star, which is kind of neat, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, Zalen Wheel asks, how does the ARC compare to the Galactopedia? Other libraries say, okay, sorry, how does the ARC compare to the Galactopedia and other libraries in the universe of Retor and our Mobiglass apps? Like how will, how will the different apps differentiate themselves between the Galactopedia, the star map, the Mobiglass, etc.? Will they all just access the same information? I can't, I can't recall if we actually established that the, the Galactopedia was a publication of the ARC. Um, I mean, it makes sense. The nice thing about the ARC is that they try to be independent, so we can have, you don't, we don't have to worry about like through who, whose lens is this history being told type thing, so they can be a bit more impartial and a bit more objective. But I don't recall, actually. I, I, that's a... Yeah, the, the Galactopedia is going to be kind of that, that pure information, whereas we've already kind of established uh, more flavor text-based information. Like the Galactic Guides, for instance, definitely have their own tone to them when they're describing these planets and systems versus what you would expect from the Galactopedia, which would be more just pure, unfiltered information. Um, I figure the same would probably be going to a library at a university or something. You would be getting more kind of scholarly papers, which would be different than the information you'd expect in a Galactopedia. But we definitely won't be putting, we won't be writing the Galactopedia like a scholarly paper. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the scholarly paper stuff would just be, like you would find a short little excerpt like you see in other games where we just yeah. do a couple paragraphs for, for fun and flavor of uh, research being done mm -hmm. at a university or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Darkstar wants to know if we can 
if we can say how many planets make up the United Empire of Earth. Oof. Oh. Offhand. Oh, how many? Oh, it's on our spreadsheet. Yeah, we've got 90 on the star map, 90 systems. Um, was it was that planets or systems question? It's just planets. 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 Uh, uh, I, is, is the United Empire Earth, is it like a, a federation like it was in Star Trek with member worlds and non-member worlds? It's a systems rather than worlds. Okay, member systems? Yeah, yeah. They, they control systems. And so how many systems does the UEE control? Um, outs Many? More than five? I'm guesstimating around 60, but I need to actually check the, the spreadsheet can, just to be absolutely sure. Can someone open up the star map at home and count for us? For yes. <laughs> yes. The show's got eight minutes left. If somebody can open up the star map yeah. and start counting systems controlled by the UEE. Yeah, Let I us know have, before the end of the show. I can have a solid answer for you if I can check my data. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Pappy Boyington. We don't usually read out the names, but I've just been enjoying it so much today. Uh, are there any old Earth myths taken into account for the star citizen lore and possible future missions for explorers? There are 34. Old Earth myths. <laughs> <laughs> That's a Bob Dylan answer. Yeah. So there's 34 systems in the UE? UE systems. How about old Earth myths? Uh, I can't think of any off the top of my head. We haven't been playing kind of into that more fantastical aspect as much. We've definitely been drawing from history a bunch for, as Dave described earlier, from taking things as seeds, as starting nuggets before we spin off in our wild star citizen directions. But as we start doing more of those creepy kind of PU missions, maybe we'll start looking at weirder and wilder stuff. You can salt myths sometimes in the names of the planets, like the or the systems, Hades system. Mm -hmm. That's true. Like that. yeah. And the naming yeah. convention, at least. The systems, the systems used, definitely. Like, used, like the, all this, the, 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 the Perry liner, uh, gods of war. Why is that? Because it was a war. <laughs> Let's call him on the nose, Miss <laughs> uh, All right. Well, let's see. Talk about hybrid. No, they won't know that stuff, guys. All right. Well, back to the paper. Corin Avatan. Vatan. Avatan. It's not fun when I don't know how to say it. How can we expect all of the lore to be revealed in the game? Will most of the lore, like the Terra Mills lore, be only accessible through the Galactopedia? Will there be random data pads scattered throughout the galaxy that we'll need to find and collect to get the lore? Essentially, what I'm asking, I like when he explains himself, is how, well, or is how and what is being done to allow the lore to be accessed in-game, rather than needing to alt-tab to different external sources? Um, that's, so that's a good question and something we're, we're starting to explore as we develop out missions. I, I'm hoping that it's going to be a wide variety of sources uh, to come across of what will you be able to uh, garner from the Galacticpedia is that we were talking about the Galacticpedia being kind of a, a go-to for very light summaries of everything so maybe on Terra Mills you'd get like a a short description of the company, but if you wanted the full history of them, for example, you would have to go visit their mill in Bremen, and then when you're on that planet, you would be able to learn more uh, about that company. Or maybe when you pick up a, a box of their tasty snack, uh, you look on the back and they have a little write-up about their company that you can read. So kind of blending in that immersion versus just throwing huge amounts of data at you. I think things, you, you make a more uh, of a connection with information when you've kind of earned it yourself. So I like that approach. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, it's a lot of these things too are, are used as launching points for, because we get asked a lot to, to come up with backgrounds for these companies for um, artists to start designing component parts, for example, uh, and stuff like that. So yeah, as exactly as Will said, like you, you can kind of infer the, the personality of Terra Mills or some of these companies just based off their advertising, the quality of their products, 
uh, stuff like that. So you can kind of get us get your own sense of it. And that's sort of the kind of the fun thing about what kind of Chris is building here is that we can do that type of um, really kind of involved deep dive into these companies that normally would you would just sort of slap together a product with some stats and, and kick it out the door. But, you know, as we're doing ad, we can do ad campaigns and stuff like that. We can really make it pretty rich and, and, and really fun. So you get to kind of determine the lore on your own based on how they're presenting themselves to you rather than, as Will said, like, you know, just finding a, a paragraph or two that sums them up completely in, in a very kind of almost meta way. A little bit mind blowing, actually, already what we have available for these kind of background write ups on these companies. I mean, I can't think of a few other games that would have a couple pages written up on a vending machine manufacturer. So, I, I mean, that is just really exciting <laughs> on its own. So, kudos to us, I guess. Good job, <laughs> us. <laughs> All right. Last question is from me, actually. How many alien races have been discovered at this point? In, the, in in star citizen history in 29, by 2946 how many alien races has humanity encountered do have we shared all of the races with people yet or are there some that we haven't shared yet do you mean like sentient spacefaring yeah, people like tavaran banu vandul shion active, active ones we, we've come across a couple, we've mentioned in the lore, a couple civilizations that have collapsed or we found the ruins of them. Um, Haitians. There's a planet with a cephalopod race. Well, yeah, we have the developing systems that are protected planets that we have. Uh, alien life that may become a civilization, we're watching that grow. As far as um, like not announced alien uh, species, um, we haven't announced any. <laughs> yeah, that's what you announce it. Ask me if, if, if that's on the cards, what, will the will the be, will the ability to discover an alien race be something on the cards somewhere down the line? Uh, I think the Kurthak is going to be a, a big moment when that does happen, and yeah, that's going to yeah. happen once the game launches. <laughs> so that's farther down the road. Okay. And for those uh, developing. Alien races. Uh, what happens if a player lands on those planets? Do they, do they can they affect the development of that culture? Great question. They're arrested by the Federation. That's a really good question. Okay. <laughs> you can purchase them. I didn't promise an answer, guys. I just said I would have an answer. Hopefully, you can eat eat them. Capture, capture one of them. Mm-hmm. All right. But if you well, cook them right. Mm-hmm. Teach right. them. Well, that theory. brings to a wrap our February subscriber edition of Reverse the Verse. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we'll be back uh, with a regular Reverse the Verse on Friday. Uh, Around the Verse comes out tomorrow at noon Pacific. Uh, Will, John, Adam, Sherry, thank you for joining us here in the studio. I specifically left Dave off for a reason. <laughs> Dave knows what he did. I just don't want to, you know. Yeah. He's feeling isolated yeah. enough. D- Dave knows what he did. <laughs> make it public. <laughs> well, thank you too, Dave, for, for, for taking the time and joining us. It's pretty late there now, isn't it? Uh, it's eight. Time time. Time. Yeah. All right, guys. Yeah. Thanks for watching. Everybody wave. Bye. Hennessy, turn the camera off. <laughs>